Hey there, friend, Pastor Justin Simmons with Life Source Church, Perry Hall, coming to you with what I believe is going to be a message that brings hope and healing and restoration to your life. I believe it's going to be a word that as it ministers to you, as you listen, it's going to draw you closer and closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to ask you to tune in through the duration of the word and at the conclusion of the word to meet me back here where we're going to pray together and believe that God is going to do something powerful in your life. I'll see you in a few moments. Well, as I said last week, and you know, remain standing if you are able to, uh, as you open up your Bible back to the book of Acts 19. I've been in this series, uh, Come Holy Spirit, because how many of you know that we need a church that is endued with Holy Ghost power that is not found in this world or of this world. But we, in this hour in 2024, we must open our doors to the Holy Spirit to come and move in our midst and in our lives. Somebody, Do you agree with that word this morning, church, that we need the Holy Spirit? Raise your hand if you need the Holy Spirit. Come on, raise your hand if you need the Holy Ghost as you open up your Bible back up to Acts 19. I read this last week, and, you know, if, uh, if, if this bores you by me reading it again, uh, I don't apologize. How many of you have read the Bible many times? And how many of you would say that every time you read it, it doesn't get boring? How many of you know that when you read it once and you get something, that you read it a second time and you get a second revelation? When you read it a third time, you get a third revelation and a fourth revelation. And the Word of God is a living Word. It's a t double-edged sword. Hallelujah. And I, it is full of just life when you read that Word. And so Acts 19, and we're going to start at verse 1. I'm going to read this again. Uh, and, you know, this is mainly for those that... Perhaps you weren't here last week, um, so you can hear this word. I'll give a quick recap in a moment of what I spoke on last week and go into the next part of my sermon uh, for today. Acts 19, verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. How many of you know that is the condition of the 21st century church right there? That many had not even heard of the Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism of water and repentance. So then Paul said, John, indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him that is on Christ Jesus. And they heard this, and they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. They spoke with tongues and they prophesied, church, because how many of you know when the Holy Spirit gets on you, you'll never talk the same way. You'll never speak the way, same way as you did before. You'll never be the same again when the Holy Ghost comes upon your life. That's why we need the Spirit of God upon our lives, church. Amen. Father, I pray, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Pray, open our ears, open our eyes to see and to receive what you have to say to us today. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in this place, Lord, and we give you glory for the word of God, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Last week, I began teaching I've been talking about the Holy Spirit, as I said a moment ago, but last week I started talking specifically and teaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
If, and just to give a quick reminder to some of the things that I highlighted last week that I talked about when it came to the whole, a baptism of the Holy Spirit, that uh, it is in the blueprint of the church according to the Word of God. When Jesus Christ said in Matthew 16 that upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I'll give you the keys to the kingdom and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What Jesus was inferring by saying what he said to the disciples in Caesarea Philippi in Matthew 16 is what he was saying is, is I'm calling for a church that is going to be in with power, that I've given you the keys to the kingdom to bind some things on the earth that are bound in heaven and to loose some things on the earth that are loosed in heaven. And how many of you know that we need to be a church in this hour that is full of Holy Ghost power that comes and is endued from on high? That Jesus' words, that what they infer to us today is that we are not called to be a limp wrist spineless, weak bride, but we are to be a bride that will fight the good fight of faith, that will walk in the manifest power gifts that Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, church, that we are endued according to Jesus's will and blueprint that we ought to have power upon us. Acts chapter 1, as I said last week, Jesus, when he promised the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he said that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses through Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and through the other most ends of the earth. And I thank God for our spiritual experiences. I thank God for last week what he did in this place where we saw a couple people get filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I had somebody say to me in this church that they can't even remember the last time that they saw in one service on the same Sunday where we saw salvations and the baptism of the Holy Ghost take place. And as I thought about that, uh, those folks saying that to me, I began to think, shouldn't that be the norm of what is happening in church on Sunday morning? Shouldn't we see on Sunday morning salvations and people getting saved? And then I thought, even further. Shouldn't we see on Sunday mornings, week after week, not just on Pentecost Sunday or the weeks that come following Pentecost Sunday, but I began to think and wonder, shouldn't we see every single Sunday when we come to the house of God that we see the power of the Holy Spirit, the immersion and the baptism of the Holy Ghost come upon people in 2024? But we've allowed religion to quench the Holy Ghost. As I gave a little bit of a plug last week, I said, you know, I've, I've looked at church history and I've tried to picture and determine when did the charismatic gifts of the Spirit begin to cease in the church and in church history. And the only thing that I can put my finger on, and I would challenge anybody in this place to study some church history, I believe it is important for us to know the blueprint of what Jesus Christ called the body of Christ. Christ to be. Raise your hand if you know that you're the body of Christ. Jesus said, you know, Jesus gave us this blueprint that we would, uh, and, and he promised the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The only thing that I can put my finger on that when the gifts of the Spirit begin to cease and we had uh, hundreds of years that passed by where we don't see any mention of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the only thing that I can put my finger on by studying church history is religion crept in. And religion suppressed the move of the Spirit. And I began to think about that. And isn't that the tactic of the devil? If you don't know what the tactic of the devil it is, is what he will do is he will take, he knows what God has commissioned and what God has ordained and ordered through his word. But how many of you know that what the devil does is he takes what God has commissioned, ordered, and ordained, and he makes it into a counterfeit to make it look like it's real, to make it look like it's legit, to make it look like it is the thing that God has called us to be. And that's how he tricks and trips up people in this 
this hour, and that is how he tricks and trips up people in the church. If you don't know how uh, people determine what is counterfeit versus what is real, you can study and look at that FBI agents when they are on money, money laundering cases, that when they begin to learn to identify what is counterfeit and what is real, is what they will do is they don't get handed counterfeit money to them. They get handed the real thing to them. And they begin to feel it. They begin to smell it. They know how the texture of it. They know the look of it. What's the point of what I'm saying? That if we would get our hands on the counterfeit move of the Spirit of God, and I'm sorry, if we would begin to get our hands on the real, legit thing that comes from God, that we will understand what is a counterfeit and what is real. And the devil is trying to get our hands full of a lot of counterfeit things in this hour. But I don't know about you, but I want the real thing. I want the real spirit of God in our churches. I want the real spirit of God in my household, upon my wife, upon my children, in Jesus' name. I don't want the counterfeit. I want the real deal, church. And that's what the devil does is he takes things and he makes a counterfeit out of them to make it seem like it's real. But how many believe that in these last days that we are going to see a people rise up that are going to get back to the real of what God has I feel his spirit in this that we, God is calling forth a remnant in this hour to get back to being the real people of God, the real bride of Christ. How many, like some people will say, well, I'm just waiting for Jesus to return. I'm just kind of sitting back because I know things are going to happen. No, you are the body of Christ, church. And the body of Christ is compelled to do something for the kingdom of God. We're not just called to just sit back, warm a seat on Sunday morning, and do nothing with the this thing. No, we know God is sovereign, but we are the body of Christ and the body has hands and feet and eyes and fingers and we have got a job to do in this hour. We got to do something in this hour. And so we got to be the real deal. But last week I hit one point. I only hit one point last week, you know, in my sermon. And I talked about how the baptism of the Holy Spirit is on the road in our journey in the Christian life. How many of you thank God for the cross, right? I thank God for the old rugged cross. I thank God for salvation. But how many in this place know that when you get saved, that that is not the stopping point for you? But when you give your life to Jesus Christ, that is the launching pad for his spirit to take you into something greater and more powerful than you could possibly imagine. I thank God for salvation. I thank God that I am saved and I am sanctified. We used to say it in the old school days that I'm saved, I'm sanctified, and I am what? I am filled with the Holy Ghost. I want to call forth for a people in in this church that you won't just chase after salvation or stop at the foot of the cross but how many of you know that there's a, a tomb that lies ahead after the cross at Calvary but I thank God that there is not a body laying in that tomb but we can look at the tomb and we can say we can see it as a symbol of resurrection power for you and I in this place that when we are on this journey in our faith in Jesus Christ, we, we begin at the old rugged cross, but a several steps further, 
There's a tomb that symbols the resurrected power of Jesus Christ. And my Bible says that that same power that rose Jesus Christ out of the grave is in each and every one of us. How many in this place are thankful this morning that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that you don't have to go simply to a church building? I thank God for this church building. But how many of you know if we didn't have a building, we could just go up to Honey go park and get into a baseball field and we can have revival because we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You and I have the Spirit of God living on the inside of us. Sometimes we forget that because we think that when we come to, that I got to go to church on Sunday morning because the Holy Spirit is in the church. Now I'm not saying this to give anybody a pass to not get gather together. Your Bible says that we should not forsake the assembling together as the manner is. And the Bible says actually we ought to do it all the more as the day approaches. They might shut the doors of a church. They might try to put locks on the uh, and chains on the church. But I want to tell you, you can lock up the building, but we're still going to be the church. And we'll have church wherever the Spirit of God takes us. If it's in the parking lot or if it's in the Safeway or Wise Grocery Store parking lot or on a baseball field, wherever it is. We're going to be the church and we will not be stopped in Jesus' name. The church is not a building. Look at your neighbor and say, it's you. The church is you. And this road that, we are, that I talked about last week, spirit baptism is on the road in the Christian life. And God is looking for a church in this hour that are not going to stop simply at the cross of Calvary, but are going to go to the resurrect the tomb that symbolizes resurrection power, and that are also going to eventually uh, not be standing in front of a tomb, but are going to make their way to an upper room where the power of God can come in and move in like a mighty rushing wind. This wasn't a simple little breeze that that book of Acts chapter 2 talks about. The Bible describes it as a violent rushing wind. This was a violent thing. You know, we had these storms the other day, right? And we do need to pray for our neighbors. You know, actually, a tornado hit in my old neighborhood over in uh, Middle River. We have a couple people uh, in this church that live in that neighborhood. We got to lift them up in prayer. But I thought, but I was thinking about this uh, the other day. Some of these tornadoes they recorded the other day had winds of 105 miles an hour. And I thought, this violent wind that came into the upper room, do you know what it did? It shook the place. It shook the foundations of the upper room. I don't know about you, but I'm looking for a move of God in this hour that will shake this world. I'm looking for a move of God that will shake the church. Come on, we've been apathetic, we've been complacent, and we've been asleep for far too long. And I think that what we need in this hour where we've got a lot of religion in churches, we got a little bit, we got a lot of uh, drive through church with a couple songs and a quick sermon head and no Holy Spirit. But what we need and what is going to shake this world is going to be a remnant church that will be shaken by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, I was saying this word at our men's meeting the other day that has been uh, just sitting inside of me that there is a story in the book of Acts that Paul and Silas, they're in the region of Thessalonica and they're preaching the gospel. The Bible says that for three consecutive Sabbaths that Paul went into the Sabbath teaching the scriptures. And what happened was is that they kept preaching the word of God. They kept on preaching Jesus Christ, being born of a virgin Mary, being crucified on the cross, but not being on the cross any longer, but going to the grave and getting up out of the grave and being seated at the right hand of the Father. And the Bible says, says that what they did was is that the officials made their way to the house of a man named Jason. Do you know the story, church? They made their way to the house of a man named Jason. And what happened was is Paul and Silas wasn't there, but there was a few brethren of the early church that were in Jason's house. And they were dragged out of Jason's house. And the authorities described the church in that hour as the ones who were shaking up 
the world. What a reputation that the early church had that they would turn the world upside down. Hallelujah. And I, what I believe God is looking for is for a church in this hour that will turn this world upside down for Jesus Christ. Actually, I'll say it like this. Our world has been turned upside down. Up is down, left is right, good is evil. Men can be women. I saw this video. Oh, man, well, I wasn't gonna. I wasn't gonna go here, but I gotta go here. I saw this video about a month ago of a baby being born, and a and and a man with a beard, with makeup and long hair, looking like a woman, laying in a hospital bed, and when this baby was born through a surrogate. The baby was taken from the surrogate and laid upon the chest of this trans woman. I'm just going to call him what he, a man, a man, a man. He's a man. Baby's crying and everything. But let me tell you what. When that body goes to the grave one day, they're going to look at the bones, and it ain't going to have the hips of a woman. They're going to look at the bones of that body and they're going to say, a man lays here. I don't, it doesn't care what the name on the tombstone is. It doesn't care what, their, what uh, their driver's license says as far as their gender identification. But when one day that body goes to the grave and the body decays and, the bo and it's all that's left in that grave is bones, people and scientists are going to look at those bones and they're going to say, a man laid in this grave. You cannot alter and change what God has designed and created, church. I don't care how you spin it. I don't care what you have to say about it. And the thing that's going to counter, counter this stuff is going to be a spirit-filled church. That will boldly declare the word of God. And this world is, it seems like this world is turned upside down. What we need is a remnant church that will turn it right back side up in Jesus' mighty name. We'll say, no, a man is a man. A woman is a woman. That uh, You can't choose whatever you want to be. How you were made is how God designed for you to be made. Because you are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. We need a church filled and endued with power from on high that will say, no. We're standing upon the principle of what a biblical marriage ought to be. That it is a man and a woman in Jesus' mighty name. That we are going to stand strong and firm on the word of God no matter what. That is the kind of church that will turn this world right side up. It's the road of Christianity. Like I said last week, but I want to give you two quick things real quick. And then we'll just do whatever the Holy Spirit leads. I had the road, and I want to give you the mode. Spirit baptism is the mode for supernatural spiritual power from on high, church. How many of you know you can't do this in the flesh? We cannot do this in the flesh. You can't even do it by leaning on the arm of religion. We need the Spirit of God. Spirit baptism is the mode. It's the source of spiritual power. Paul in Acts 19, the Bible says he laid his hands on the people in Ephesus, the disciples in Ephesus. And when they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they began to speak in other tongues and they began to prophesy. How many of you know we need some people in this hour that will prophesy? And when people hear the word prophesy, people think about, uh, uh, they think about dreaming and they think about uh, making a, a, of a forth telling of some things. But how many of you know that the primary gift, uh, the uh, gift of prophecy, the primary function of prophecy is not for prediction and forth telling, but it is for declaration and foretelling of the word of God. The Bible says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That means that what God is looking for in this hour is looking for a people that will boldly declare prophetically the word of God, that we will take this word and we will foretell it to the word, the world, that we will declare it to a dying world that needs to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And how many of you know that this declaration of this word, that it takes a bit of Holy Ghost unction and power to do. The early church 
in the book of Acts, the Bible talks about how Peter and John, that they were taken before the council. It's the same people that crucified Jesus and sent them to the cross. And when they left that, they were, they were told to not preach Jesus. You know what they said? I'm going to preach Jesus anyways. Where's that kind of boldness? And it was so bold that when they went back to their early church followers and they told the early church about what had happened, that what the, all those people in that, room, in that room, what they did was is they began to have a prayer meeting. And they begin to have a prayer meeting and they begin to ask the Holy Spirit for the same boldness and the same courage that Peter and John displayed before the high council. And what happened was is the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them. Because how many of you know that when you get the Holy Ghost upon you that it comes with a lot of things and it comes with boldness and it comes with courage to declare the word of God, church. This is why we need the Holy Ghost because we're living in an hour and in a day where it seems like people are timid, shy, and afraid to declare what this word says. But how many of you that love the word of God this morning and are thankful for the word that the word brings life, the word brings liberty, it brings healing, it brings deliverance, it brings salvation, and it brings freedom that man cannot live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. This is why church you need to be in the Bible. It's awfully quiet in this church. Only 18% of Christians read their Bible on a regular basis. 18%. That's a sad statistic. What's going to turn this world upside down will be a church filled with Holy Ghost power and people that are hungry for that word. That get up in the morning and they say, I don't want anything else. Before I can have my first sip of coffee, I have got to go into the word of God. You cannot, let me just, the Bible says that the word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Now ask yourself this, how can you walk down a dark path if you don't have a light? The light is the word. You need, look at your neighbor and say, you need the word of God. You need the word, church. You can't do this in the flesh. Power. The Holy Spirit is the source of power for this thing. All throughout the book of Acts, you can see all kinds of stories. I was reading the other day about Stephen. Do you remember uh, Stephen's story? The Bible says in Acts chapter 6... That Stephen was a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that what happened was is that he stood before the religious folks and he began to go and talk about Abraham. This is all the, they, they were all about the old. They were all about the patriarchs. He began to talk to them about Abraham. Then he began to talk about Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and he began to talk about Moses. And what happened was is he looked at the religious crowd and he called them a bunch of stiff-necked and crooked people. He said that, the, that your fathers killed the prophets. He called them out on it. And what what happened was is they dragged Stephen out of the city. They took him outside and they got ready to stone him. And the Bible says that as he was on his knees, and this was Stephen, a man, the Bible says, full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. That what happened was is as he was on his knees about to get stoned, that he looked up to, he looked up to the heavens. And the Bible says, and I love what it says, it says that he saw the Son of God standing Standing at the right hand of the Father. Now what is amazing about that is because your Bible says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession. But what Stephen got a glimpse of is he got a glimpse of Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Why did he stand? Because when you have the Holy Ghost upon your life and you begin with boldness and courage to declare the word of God, to declare the good news of Jesus Christ in the midst of a culture and a people that reject it, that hate it, that don't want anything to do with it. What it causes Jesus to do is to get off his seat and have a standing ovation that you are standing strong on the word of God, full of the Holy Ghost. This is why we need the spirit of God in our lives, church. Anybody want to get a standing ovation from Jesus? 
Raise your hand if you want to get a standing ovation from Jesus in this hour. I don't want to just, I don't, I don't want to just make it, church. The Bible says he, those that endure until the very end shall be saved. But I'm just not going to make it just by the skin of my teeth. But I am crossing over one day and I am running. I'm going to do as what Paul said. I'm going to run this race. I'm going to keep the faith, hallelujah, and fight the good fight that is in front of me. You're not, just, you're not called to barely make it, but you're called to have victory. He's calling for a victorious church in this hour. It's the mode of Christianity. And how many of you are thankful for the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit rises up inside of you, even in your weakest hour and moments? If you don't believe it, Paul talked about it. He talked about it in Romans chapter 8. How many of you have moments and times when you don't even know what to say or what to pray, that you are just feeling so weak, so burdened, so heavy laden, that you don't even know what to say and open up your mouth? But you know what, what Paul says? This is why we need the Holy Ghost. Let me give you actually what the Word says. I got the Word on my iPad here. I want to give it to you from Romans chapter 8, if we could put it up. That even when we are in our weakest moments, we don't know what to pray. This is what, why we need the Holy Spirit. It says the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray. For as we ought, but what? The Spirit himself makes intercession for us with what? With groanings that cannot be uttered. Talking about tongues. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And I want to stop there for a moment. How many of you know that there is a difference between, I'm going to talk a little bit about it next week, about the gifts of the Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit. How many of you know that there is a difference between praying in tongues and speaking in tongues? There is a biblical difference between praying in tongues and, and speaking in tongues. And people will say, well, we need an interpreter. When we're speaking in tongues, as the sister was earlier and gave the interpretation, that's when we need the interpretation. But how many of you know that what your prayer language is, is when you're speaking in tongues, when you're, when you're praying in tongues, when you are listening to me preach as the pastor, and all of a sudden I'm stirred up. The Bible says in the book of Jude to stir yourself up by praying in the Holy Ghost. That what I'm doing when, I, in, in, when I'm in the middle of preaching, in the word and you hear uh, me go I'm stirring myself up with the Holy Ghost. I'm praying the Bible says that I'm speaking not to man but I'm speaking to God because I don't know what to say. Sometimes, hear me out church, hear me out. Sometimes when you're in your weakest moment and you don't even know what to say the devil's got a, he's got his hand on your tongue and you don't even, you're so broken, you're so busted, you're so tore up in your situation and you're feeling so weak. Do you know that there are many days where I feel like I've come off the battlefield in the spirit and I come in this church. Can I tell the truth? There's days that I feel like in my body, I don't want to be here. That's the truth. And you know what? The same is for you. The same is for you if you want to tell the truth and shame the devil. There's days I don't want to be here. But I need something that's inside of me to tell this flesh, to tell this vessel that it's not by might and it's not by power, but it is by your spirit, says the Lord. And what I need is I need an intercessor that is on the inside of me that will begin to speak with groanings that people, that man, that even I don't understand. Why? Because I don't know what to say. And what I need is that heavenly language, that language of angels. I need that heavenly language to begin to rise up, stir up my soul, and begin to make intercession session and speak on my behalf to God. The spot, the Bible says that the spirit makes intercession because it knows what you need. And even when you don't know what you need, you begin to let it out. You begin to release that heavenly prayer language and raise your hand. If when you begin to do that, even when you don't know what to say, or maybe you don't even feel like going to church or you don't feel like praying, and all of a sudden, you begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. 
Raise your hand in this place if it does something and it stirs you up. Raise your hand if it begins to take you out of your funk. It begins to take you out of the, what, that mindset, that apathy, or that lazy feeling in your mind. That exhaust. When I'm exhausted, I begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. And I begin to stir myself up, as Jude said, by praying in the Holy Ghost. I begin to go around the, in my house. I'm in the car because, like I said last week, you need the Holy Ghost when you're on 95. And I begin to shout out a little bit. I'm not speaking to you, but the Spirit inside of me is making intercession and speaking to Him. And here's the thing. And I love this because we miss this all the time. Paul said that in Romans 8. And he's, let me give you what it says again. He says, the spirit also helps in our weakness for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So as I said, what he does, what the spirit of God does on the inside of us is when we don't know how to pray, when we are in our weakest moment and we begin to release our heavenly language and we begin to stir ourselves up in the spirit, what we can do is because the spirit that makes intercession inside of us speaking to God, he knows what I need. He knows what you need. And it's why Paul says in the next verse, now I know that all things will work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. See, you got to put the scriptures together in its context because what he's saying is when you are weak, when you don't know what to pray and you begin to stir yourself up with your prayer language, now I know that everything will work together for my good church. You got to put it together. You got to put it together. The last thing I want to give you, because I want to go somewhere next week in another, another direction. And I want to ask you to stand up to your feet. I'll close and make this point quick. We have the road. Spirit baptism is the road of Christianity. It's on the road of Christianity. We have the mode. It's the source of power. And it's also the showed. Now, what do I mean by the showed? In the book of Acts chapter 2, the Bible says they went up into an upper room. What were they doing? They were having a prayer meeting. What were they praying for? They were praying and waiting on a promise. But how many of you know what happened next? What happened was is when the Holy Spirit came into the upper room like a mighty rushing wind, and the Bible says that, they, that what sat upon them were tongues of fire that came upon them. But how many of you know that once the Spirit of God came into that upper room, they did not stay in the upper room? Spirit of God talked to me, he talked to me a little bit about this recently. That we pray for, uh, we pray all the time in churches. We pray for an upper room experience, an upper room encounter. We want to be in the upper room. But how many of you know because of what the Bible shows us, we're not called to stay in the upper room. We're not called to stay in the upper room. I thank God for the upper room. I thank God for the revival prayer meetings. Uh, we had a powerful prayer meeting this, uh, this past Monday night. You need to come tomorrow night to Monday Night Prayer Church. We had a powerful time in His presence praying and interceding this past Monday. I thank God for those upper room experiences. But we were not meant to stay in the upper room. What happened in, in Acts chapter 2? The Bible says that they left the upper room. And they went out into the streets. And the early church was not marked by a bunch of theologians that knew all the word of God and knew all the Old Testament and knew all the prophets of old and their words. The, you know that the very, I love, I love the Holy Spirit. The very first thing that marked the early church was not a bunch of astute theologians who knew everything. The very first thing that happened and marked the early church was a people that were drunk. They were crazy. They were mocked. They were ridiculed. They were laughed at. They were 
drunk. There were some people here last week that the Holy Spirit fell upon them, and they said, I, I, I need to get somebody maybe to drive me home. You know, it kind of, we see, religion t- teaches us and makes us think that the, the church started on the foundation of strong, theological, edu- educated people. No, the early church started with a bunch of people that were hungry, waiting on a promise, and got drunk under the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible says, not me. But, the, but they left that upper room and they went out into the streets. The Spirit of God spoke to me. This world is dying. This world needs to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And it can't come from a people that want to sit in the upper room after they have received that which was promised to them by the prophet Joel that in the last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters will prophesy and your young men will have visions and your old men will dream dreams and upon my manservants and maidservants I will pour out my spirit and they will prophesy what he is looking for is for a church that will not stay in the upper room after receiving what they have been promised but that they will leave the upper room It's time to come out of the upper room, church, and hit the highways and the byways. This world, this world needs to hear the gospel message. And here's the thing, this world needs to see a people, hear me now, that are drunk with new wine that comes from heaven. Why is it that God, help me right now while I'll say this. Why is it that there are spirit-filled people that will hide the power of the Holy Ghost in their lives? I know pastors that are filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that they will hide the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that they will hide in a corner, cover up their mouth while speaking in tongues and things like that. Let me just say this. Look at me right now, church. If you're watching online, look at me if you can see me over the heads of the folks in these seats. Why are we hiding the thing that this world needs to see? That we are living in a world that has no hope, they're broken, they're lost, they're hurting, and what they need to see is a church full of Holy Ghost power. They need to see it in you, church. That's why call me weird. I'm still going to pray and stir myself up in the Holy Ghost. Call me weird when I prophesy and declare. And people will say this about prophecy. They will, well, you know, there's a lot of people that, you know, they say all kinds of crazy things. You know what? Although that is true, we have to remember what Paul said. He said to not despise prophecy. That's what Paul said. And what we do is because there's a couple bad apples and there's a bun- and there's a number of people that give fake prophecies that we all of a sudden we disqualify and discredit the office of a prophet and we disqualify and discredit people that speak prophetically. No, you know what? When my son and my daughter aren't serving the Lord, I'm speaking prophetically and I'm saying in the name of Jesus Christ, they are going to serve you, Lord. I'm going to speak prophetically. I'm going to, I'm, by God, the devil, the devil is going to know that he picked a fight with the wrong person. When you come up against my family, I'm not going to sit back and, oh, why is this happening to me? No, I'm going to get my word. I'm going to start praying in the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to say, in Jesus' mighty name, my son shall worship and serve Jesus. My daughter shall serve the Lord. My grandbaby will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You don't get terrified and spineless when you're up against the wall, backed up into a corner by the powers of darkness. Where's the Holy Ghost spirit-filled people that will straighten themselves up and look the devil in the eyes and say, devil, you picked a fight with the wrong person today. In Jesus' name, you've got to go. It's the kind of power this world needs to see. 
That's why we need, that's why, Lord, I'm not going to preach all this again. That's why we need intercessors in this hour in the church. Do you know that the church, the body of Christ, has chased intercessors out the door? I'm going to talk to the, the process because they're intercessors. Let me hold your guys' hands for a moment. They're intercessors. They're prayer warriors. Do you know I've been in a prayer room, prayer rooms with them in church? The church chases out the intercessors. Am I telling the truth, sister? I'm telling the truth. Churches chasing out the intercessors. Jesus said in his word that my house will be a house of prayer. Therefore, this house will be a house of intercession. And what we, we need in this hour, we need some prayer warriors. We need some people that know how to get into the prayer closet and do some spiritual warfare. Tear down some strongholds. Come against some principalities and powers. We're not wrestling against the flesh. We're not wrestling against people in this world. We're wrestling against the powers of darkness and the principalities and the wicked hosts in high places that are influencing the people in this hour. That is what our fight is with. And we need intercessors that are in the body of Christ that are looking at what's going on in America and saying, I am not going down without a fight we've got to cry aloud and spare not in this hour and boldly declare the word of God by the unction of the Holy Spirit we need the Spirit of God we got to get out of the upper room church 3,000 people one day got saved not because they stayed in the upper room because they got out of the upper room. Listen to me. And then I'm going to land this plane. Whatever the Holy Spirit does is what the Holy Spirit does. America needs a bride immersed in the power of the Holy Spirit. America needs intercessors in the church. We're going to see things turn around. It's going to take a people and dude with power from on high. We're not here. We can't play games. We can't play games. And here's the thing. Your one hour religious experience that you have on a Sunday morning is not going to cut it. It's not going to cut it. It's not going to change it. We have, what we have done is we try to, we say this stuff and I can't stand it. If I'm telling the truth and shame, shame of the devil. Well, we can't, we should, we should not put God in a box. You can't put God in a box. You couldn't do anything to put him in a box. Instead, stop putting yourself in a box and dragging, trying to drag God along with you into the box. If anybody's boxed in, it's, it's us. Does anybody, does it break anybody's heart to see what is going on in this hour? I gotta sit for a minute. I know you're standing, I'm gonna sit. I am heartbroken that there isn't more spiritual grief in the body of Christ for what is going on in this hour. Can I tell the truth for a moment, Sister Sandy? Does anybody even care in this room about what is going on? Do you care? I'm gonna be, can, I gotta get blunt and bold for a minute. There's people in this room that, if I gotta be honest with you, and this, this is gonna sound hard to hear, but you need to hear it. There's people that have gotten so laxed in their faith that you don't care about what's going on in this world unless it affects you personally. That's the truth. That sounds kind of harsh to say. No, the truth is what's gonna set somebody free today. And there's people watching everything that's going on in this hour. They don't pray, they don't intercede, they don't read their Bible. 
And they're looking at all this stuff. And you know what's going to happen one day if they don't get their act together and get their head out of the proverbial sand. All this stuff is going to hit the fan in greater measure. And what's going to happen is, is they're going to look around and say, what's going on? I don't understand why this is going on. No, what it is is that you chose to stay blind instead of seeing by the Spirit. We, the hour that we are in, we've got to take this thing seriously and walk by the Spirit. And if we would walk by the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. I'm concerned that people just don't care in the church anymore. I care. I believe there's some in this room that care. And I care enough to say that I'm not going down without a fight. And if I'm the only voice in the room that's speaking up, then I'm the only voice in the room that's speaking up. But I know that greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. I know who's on my side. And if I'm the only one that is standing in the room shouting and declaring the word of God because I care about what's going. I, some of you parents need to get a grip and care about what your children are getting exposed to. Some of I'm now I'm going to get bold. Some of y'all got kids that don't know a lick of scripture and they've grown up in church their entire life and mom and dad, you don't care. Now I'm getting blunt. Where's the as for me in my house, we are going to serve the Lord attitude. Where is the attitude that I am going to, I am not going down without a fight. I'm going to pray for my child. I'm going to intercede for my child. I'm going to speak the word of God to my child. But what we have these days is we got kids that are telling the parents whether they're going to church or not. Do you know if I ever to look at my mom in the face and said, I ain't going to church with you. Do you know what would have happened? Can I describe what would happen to you just without saying anything? I would have had this upside the head. She, she just said, she said, yo, I know. If I would have ever looked at my mother, sister, Sandy, and said, I ain't going to church with you. You can't, you can't make me. We got kids that look their mom and dad in the, in the face and say, you can't make me go to church. Mom and dad get the unction and get some boldness and some Holy Ghost courage inside. He say, you're not going to tell me what you are or not do. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. As long as you're in this house, we're going to church. We're going to serve the Lord whether you like it or not. You don't get a choice in this thing. You are going to the house of the Lord because I'm believing and standing on the word of God that one day you're going to get a hold of this thing that has gotten a hold of me. Now I'm going to stop. I think I've hurt somebody's feelings. And I don't say that to say it angrily. I say it out of love because we've got to get real about this thing. We got to get on fire. I said, we got to get on fire, church. We got to get hungry for him, thirsty for him. If you got to go, I know it's 1230. If you got to go hit your chicken and stuffing, go hit your chicken and stuffing. I'm going to tarry and I'm going to wait on the Lord as long as it takes. Why? Because I'm hungry for him to do what he said in his word that he would do. I need his spirit. I can't do this without his glory in my life. Raise your hands in this place all across this room. I promise I'm going to let you go soon. And if you got to go, go. I want you right now in this place. And if you got that heavenly language, begin to open up your mouth and just begin to stir yourself up. As Jude said in the Holy Spirit, begin to open up your mouth and release. Like, like Paul said, if you don't know what to pray, let that thing inside of you, that's man inside of you, make intercession on your behalf. Because he knows what you need in this place. He knows what you need in this hour. Hallelujah. And I want you in this room right now. If you've gotten cold, 
If you've gotten cold in your faith to just tell the Lord, God, I've gotten cold. Better yet, maybe you've gotten lukewarm because at least Jesus said, at least, you know, I'd rather you be cold or hot because at least the cold person can feel the fiery conviction of the Holy Spirit. The warm person thinks that they're on fire for God, but what they are is that they have actually grown cold and apathetic. They fan it and, and the Bible calls you warm. God, I want us to be hungry. I want us to be thirsty, Lord. I want you to tell him if you mean it in this place. I'm not going to strong arm you to say it, but if you mean it, just to tell the Lord, I'm hungry and I need more of you in my life. I need more of your spirit in my life. I need more of your glory in my life. I'm not satisfied with where I'm at. I'm not satisfied with what I have uh, accomplished in this spirit, Lord, but I want more of you in my life. I'm in need of more of you. I'm in need of your power. I'm in need of your spirit upon my life, Jesus. I pray as you send your Holy Spirit into the upper room, would you send your Holy Spirit into this upper room, Lord God? Not that we would just sit in it, Lord God, but Lord, that you will commission us by your Spirit to get out of the upper room, get out into the highways and the byways to take this gospel message, take it to the highways, the north, the south, the east, and the west to boldly declare the word of God. God, you're called calling us out of the upper room. You're calling us out of the box today in Jesus' name. And I know that there's a better way to live today that is only by your spirit today. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, would you do it, Lord God? Would you do it, Lord God? Do it by your spirit. We're hungry. We're longing. We're yearning. We're thirsty. If you've got that spiritual language, heavenly language, open up your mouth and release it in this room for a few moments. Hey, welcome back. I'm believing that message that you just listened to a moment ago has changed your life forever. I'm believing that the Holy Spirit moved upon you while tuning into that word and that today is a day where you are ready to make a decision to make Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you've never made that decision to make him the Lord and Savior of your life, but today is the day where you want to say yes to Jesus, I want to invite you just to pray this prayer with me to just say, Jesus, I thank you for saving me. I thank you for redeeming me. And I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you have risen from the grave and that you are coming again. And today, Jesus, I repent and I turn away from my wicked ways. The old things have passed away. And today, I'm stepping into a new way of life through you, Lord. So come and be the Lord and Savior of my life on this day. And I thank you for saving me and forgiving me. In your name we pray, amen and amen. Hey, I am excited that you may have prayed that prayer for the first time today. And if you have prayed that prayer, I want to invite you to connect with us through our website. Search for Life Source Church Perry Hall on our Facebook and Instagram. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. We would love to hear from you that you prayed that prayer today for the very first time and just welcome you into the family of the kingdom of God. God bless you and have a wonderful rest of your day. May the Lord be with you.